House of the Rising Sun. It's an important episode for the series because it's the episode where we're finding the valley, which is the uh, set of caves. So a lot of the characters are going to move there. Jack actually found this valley in the previous episode, White Rabbit. And uh, this is the episode where people are beginning to make that move out of the beach and getting out of that mentality of being immediate crash survivors to being sort of citizens of this island, to being sort of full-time dwellers of the island. These caves make too good a shelter just to be used for burial. Adam and Eve, they must have lived here. We don't need to bring the water to the people. We need to bring the people to the water. So although this is also the episode where we find the set, this episode also is the one where we find out the story of Sun. We had a chance to sort of see them really fall in love and then fall out of love. I think it was really important to see the other side of the story, where it all began and where it's going at, uh, right now. Approximately 20% of the episode is, is flashbacks to their life as a young married couple in Korea and the weird circumstances that led to them being on this oceanic flight to, from Sydney to Los Angeles and landing them on this island. That was a particularly difficult thing, not, you know, only because I don't speak or write in Korean, but it was um, about getting into a whole other cultural headspace and it was about writing about something that I don't have a huge amount of personal reference for. I think the idea that you cannot understand what Jin and Son are saying is, is a way of highlighting their otherness on the show and it allows people and the other characters to project what they think is going on with them when they may not really know. They know exactly what they need to do, especially Jin's character. He needs to know all he has to do is just talk to his wife. But he can't for so many reasons. But that is like the hardest thing to do between a man and a woman. Why would you learn English and not tell your husband? He has a bad temper. What my husband did to you today, it was a misunderstanding. No, I got it. Loud and clear. It was the watch. Your husband tried to murder me for a watch? You know, whenever there are women involved uh, <laughs> and, and men, there's a lot of uh, tension that goes on. And I think uh, he and I are maybe going to have that tension for a while. The episode has a lot of really heavy things happening in it. You know, you have Jen, the husband, attacking Michael. And there's a whole sort of racial can of worms that that opens because it's a, it's a Korean man attacking a black man. And, you know, in some places that doesn't mean anything in the United States and certain places in America, it means quite a bit. I don't know how it is in Iraq. But in the United States of America, where I'm from, Korean people don't like black people. Do you know that? Kojima, Kojima! The island isn't just a physical place necessarily. It's also that place where these people who had gone in a wayward path on their lives have come to, and it's a place where they can work these things out. And I think a lot of the plots that were, that were doing Charlie and his drugs and, and other things like that are really about being trapped in a place that forces you to confront your inner demons, a place that forces you to work out things that you know these people may not have worked out in their lives before so being in this place with all these with all these other strangers and all of these other people who don't necessarily all get along becomes a catalyst for all of the baggage that people brought in becoming something new and something dramatic and something that can be worked through in the island i was just gonna tell you not no. what's going on <laughs> he's standing on a beehive What's the beehive doing there? Beehives are supposed to be in trees. He uh, gets covered in bees and gets stung and, you know, kind of makes a couple of big mistakes for the group that he's with. <laughs> I really like insects, so, you know, any opportunity to do that work is always fun. It was cool, they were drone bees, which is the male bee, all the, all the honeybees are female, and the drones don't have any stings, so they can't hurt you. I, I don't think I would have been that bothered anyway with normal bees, because, you know, I pick up bees out of my swimming pool all the time, and I never really get too freaked out. So I can, I can pick get these up, up yeah. touch them, and... Yeah, they're very... They're quite robust, so you can hold them. Well, that, that whole thing about, about Charlie being afraid of bees is based on my own life experience, so I'm yeah, a little yeah, squeamish yeah. right now. But in a, in a hive like the one you've recreated there, mm -hmm. there may be 20 or 30 pounds of honey mm -hmm. and maybe 10 pounds of brood. Right. That's a lot of food. You can feed a lot of people with that over a long time. Here you can see where a drone just hatched out, ate their way out, 
and these are young adult male bees. You see their eyes meet in the middle of their head. They're quite robust and they have a tuft of hair on the posterior abdominal segment. That's very characteristic of drones is that tuft of hair. And they have no stingers. They're very docile, they're kind of stupid, and they're very robustly built. So they're easy to handle and for shots like we need in this film, uh, they're the ideal thing to do. It was fun. It was kind of sticky and messy because I was covered in honey so that it would stick to my arm and to my head and all that kind of stuff. Um, I really liked it. Uh, these are our tracking marks. We're using them so that the computers can uh, simulate the camera motion from the live action plate. Uh, and then when we get them into the post-production place, we can then simulate the camera move in a virtual environment. So our CGBs that would be chasing Jack and Kate will not seem to float in the scene. Hopefully, look like they're real CGBs. And then in addition to that, this is the episode where Charlie finally gives up his drugs and where he, you know, commits to uh, no longer being a drug addict. You're gonna run out. I guess it's sooner rather than later. Painful detox is inevitable. Give it up now, at least it'll be your choice. It's an interesting day today for Charlie because he has an opportunity to have someone to confide in, in Terry O'Quinn's character, Locke, who actually knows that he is a drug addict, has found out somehow. I think he's quite an intuitive kind of character anyway. It kind of sets Charlie into a flat spin because he kind of feels like he has an ally, but also it's someone who can use something against him on the island. But I think it's a nice release for Charlie. And, uh, you know, he's, he's looking for his guitar and, and finds it, which is a great thing. You really think you can find my guitar? Look up, Charlie. You're not going to ask me to pray or something. I want you to look up. In the script, I think Charlie kind of bursts into tears. And what happened kind of organically with Terry is and we were laughing at the fact that my guitar is right above us, but also I was crying at the same time, you know. So it was fun, and I think there'll be, be a good choice in there for the final cut.